All right. With roughly 20 writing credits between them, we are thrilled to talk the award-winning writing duo behind Face Off, Michael Colleri and Mike Werb. Thank you very much for being here, guys. Thank, thank you, you for having us. us. Yeah, thank you. We're going to start the first question off with, with Mr. Mike Werb. What is, uh, let me ask you this, what was the spark that inspired you specifically to start writing? And what was the journey like b- before landing, your, you know, from normal, I'm doing this as an intern to paid projects? I think the, what inspired me was sleeping on too many friends' couches after my parents spent way too much money putting me through Stanford and uh, then cutting me off since all I did was sort of travel, take drugs, and uh, and join a punk band. Uh, and so uh, none of that worked out. And the, you know, I, really the the moment was. I don't know what I was on, but it was a combination, a captain's platter of meds. Uh, I went to see um, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and uh, I walked out of there and I was like, this is what I want to do. And, uh, you know, combining combined with that was um, the fact that if I could get into grad school, I could have more student loans. Mm -hmm. And I could live off of that. So it was a combination of getting free money from uh, the UC system and the government in terms of graduate student loans and uh, and just just being so uh, just blown away by Raiders. That's That's, an answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome that like a singular movie was the spark that that made you think I want to tell stories. Now, Michael, I don't know how you're going to follow this, but same question to you. Yeah. Were you with him at Raiders? Of- I don't know. So. <laughs> same. Uh, similar. Um, aside from the loans. Uh, oh, Michael's I- from Hollywood royalty. Just tell them. <laughs> <laughs> well, not about Hollywood, but my father, I grew up kind of in a showbiz household. My father was a, um, a TV writer. And he wrote on a very famous, you guys are too young, but very famous baby boomer kids show called Captain Kangaroo. Oh, oh no, 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 my friend. I'm not, I'm too, I'm too young for Captain Kangaroo, but not too young for Death to Smoochie that referenced Captain Kangaroo. Yeah, well, yeah. Captain Kangaroo. yeah. well it, okay. it's, you know, it, it, it had become kind of a pop culture, uh, kind of iconic show, again, mo- mostly for boomers. Um, but my dad worked on that for like, you know, 20 years. And, um, so I did get a, we were in New York. It wasn't really like showbiz showbiz. We lived in a suburb and he went to New York every day, like all the other dads in the town and all that stuff. But, um, but then once in a while, like I'd come down in the morning and there would be like a Muppet being built on the kitchen table or something. Um, and, uh, so, so yeah, I got a little bit of taste of, of that kind of world and life and whatnot but mostly like mike i i I didn't have an individual film per se but i just fell in love i went to college i was bored i was directionless and i just i discovered when i went to college that you know you could wander around campus and pretty much there was a movie always playing somewhere in Mm -hmm. in the student union or this department or that department or wherever and so I just went to the movies all day. And, and actually, I did go to S- one of the big things was I went to SF State as a journalism major, but their journalism school wasn't very good. But they had a very, which I didn't know, they had a very good film film program. And like half mm-hmm. the guys on my floor were making these student films. And uh, this was kind of somewhat of a revelation to me that that you could actually go to school and do this and whatnot. So um And yeah, so same thing. I mean, a bunch of movies that were just mind blowing. uh, And I just knew I wanted to be, you know, be part of it. And this is separate from Kaliri. Um, At the time, I really, you know, there were so many problems with the band I was in. (laughs) uh, It was pretty clear. And the thing I realized I most enjoyed was writing the lyrics to the songs. And I want, I decided I, I have to do something that, that I can do by myself. And so uh, that also sort of, you know, played into it. Well then, well, how, how does that make you feel, Michael? Well, well, uh, it, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I just I thought it was funny. He got into it because I want to, I want to do something by myself. Yeah. But we're okay. talking to a duo still, right now. You know what? I hate to say it. He still does, but he can't get away. <laughs> um, uh, no, when we, well, it, this may be a different question, but we certainly, we did not start out writing as a writing duo. We started out writing separately 
and mm-hmm. and um, Mike Mike was having more success than I, but we had both kind of gotten our foot. Mike certainly got his whole body in the door, but I'd got my foot in the door when we started working together, um, yeah. which was on face off. Um, but uh, so yeah, but that but that's a real true part of it, which is uh, I think people you, you know be the a great thing about being a writer is you only need yourself uh, to yeah. create to create a world, to create a move, to oh. potentially create a movie or a franchise mm-hmm. or whatever. It's just you against your own mind and your own bad habits. Yeah. No, I mean, I, at heart, I'm a, I, 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 I do independent film, but my favorite part of the process by far is writing and I've written by myself and I've had writing partners. Um, but even when you have somebody else in the room writing with you, you guys kind of become a singular mind and you're in this isolated state where you can it's conjure working. a universe. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's if it's working. working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been on the other side. Yeah. That's a very important uh, observation. Yes. You become, Michael you, wasn't become like third, partner. you become a third person in a way. So, yeah. You weren't my first writing partner. You do remember that, right? No, I do remember that. Mike's first writing partner, if I'm correct, if I'm wrong, was Catherine Hardwick, who went on to direct Twilight, and she's a very successful production designer and director. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. We all met in film school. And just because it doesn't work with you, it doesn't, it's not to say anything about that person. Sometimes like creative minds don't mesh that in in a way that's productive for Anyway, we'll get to that with you guys, too, because there's some specific questions about like the yin and the yang of what makes a partnership work. But um, uh, Mike, your first credit, according to INDV, was Food for the Gods 2 in 1989. And I thought it was interesting. I noticed you're accredited as E. Kim Brewster. And we were wondering if there is a story behind that. I read something about a writer's strike having to do with it or something. It wasn't really the writer strike unless you could consider me in, as an individual going on strike against the production. <laughs> um, My first strike. strike. First of all, according, according to the, I think the U.S. and Canada release of the movie, it was Gnaw, G-N-A-W, Food of the Gods, part two. Um, and as a fan of uh, Ida Lupino prison films from the 50s, Uh, And Food of the Gods 1 was her last film. Uh, You know, I I hope she didn't turn in her grave too too many times over the release of this film. Um, I wrote what I thought was a uh, very uh, fascinating and strange and somewhat comedic uh, uh, sequel. And uh, that was a problem for the studio, which happened to be Carol Co. Pictures. And... uh, you know, the whole thing started to get rewritten. And so I fled Toronto for Cleveland so I could be close enough, but, <laughs> but far enough away to be called back. And um, the, the, the story behind my getting to your question, which I sh- I'm veering off too much. Um, e. Kim Brewster, which by the way, my credit in the movie should have been E. Kim Bruce star, Mike Werb rats backwards. Um, It's about giant rats attacking a college campus. I am proud of the climax of that film, which somehow we convinced the uh, uh, Olympic Canadian Olympic synchronized swimming team to uh, be opening the pool complex at the climax. And then the rats get uh, swim in from the drainage system and take them all down with uh, uh, an eddy of bloodshed. Um, It's pretty weak. (laughs) <laughs> overall the movie's quite bad but whatever you learn that says so much i'm always interested when there's somebody that like w- when the experience or the end result is so bad or traumatic that the that a person that put so much work into it is willing to like say i had nothing to like just strike this from the record please well <laughs> this this is how uh, poor the poorly the movie turned out because Burt Gordon, who directed and I think wrote Attack of the Fifty Foot Woman and di- wrote and directed the first film. The, the actually forget Ida Lupino. H. G. H. G. Wells is the one who's turning <laughs> over in his grave. Um, uh, uh, when I took my pseudonym pseudonymous credit, uh, so did so did uh, Burt Gordon. Wow. wow. So he he also has a different a pen name in there. He's anonymous too. 
I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna use your verbiage. So for next time I quit a job, I'm just gonna say we we sh- we went on strike. Just no one came along with me. There you go, <laughs> Jerry Maguire just without the girl coming out. Yeah. Now, Michael, uh, I want to ask you this. According to uh, IMDb, as we always have to say, uh, your first credit was writing was with Alfred Hitchcock Presents in 1988. Um, could you please tell us it was something iconic like that? Uh, what was that like? Yeah, it, that was a great job. So so that was the early, early days of cable. And at the time, Universal Studios owned all the uh, you know the rights to the Alfred Hitchcock show. And um, so what they decided to do was basically, you know, like they all do now, raid their libraries, try to find a way to make money off their old stuff. So what they did was they they took they basically paid for I think a hundred episodes, they just committed to like a hundred episodes or something insane um, to produce in Toronto for cheap. And what they did was they went to the old Alfred Hitchcock show from the, I guess the sixties and they took all the Alfred Hitchcock parts. So, so, you know, you may or may not have ever seen the show, but it was always like mm-hmm. these little thrillers and mysteries. And it would start with Alfred Hitchcock himself saying, Today, we are going to see, you know, and he'd give this little introduction. And then at the end, he'd wrap it up with some pithy remark. So they took, they pulled all those parts out and looked at them and said, okay, we want new stories around what he says in the beginning. So it would be like, today, we're going to the ivory towers of a university. And then, anyway, so this guy who ran that show, his brother and I were friends. And we were, his brother and I were both trying to be writers and his, and God bless my room. You know, he was my, actually my roommate. Uh, his brother said, Hey, I'll hire you guys. If you want to work on them together, which again, we never wanted to have writing partners, but it was like, yes, by all means, that's what got me in the writer's guild. And we ended up, it was the writer's guild strike that killed that job um, Mm -hmm. for uh, me in 1988, because we, we were actually on our way. We wrote, at least two and maybe, and we sold stories for like two more. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the, then the strike came. And so the, the job ended for me, unfortunately, but that was great fun because you had to figure out a story around what Hitchcock was saying in any particular thing. And they would send us, you know, we went, I mean, there was very little, almost no videotape even then, but we went right. with videotape of it all and then decided what we wanted to write about. That's the old AIP method of of movie making. Come up with a poster and a title and then write something. Yeah. 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 In the 80s. Yeah, that was that was pretty. I mean, even before the 80s, but in the 80s, it was 60s, 70s, 80s. Roger Corman. Yeah. Are you sure you didn't pitch them something about Thai pirates? No, that was that. (laughs) I don't want that. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so that was. um, Yeah. So those were those were fun shows because you only had 30 minutes and you had to trick the audience. And there's a great one, by the way, if you're just curious uh, about how they work this with Mark Hamill, um, mm-hmm. which I didn't write, but it's the most brilliant one. It's about a guy jumping off. A, he, Mark Hamill's on the ledge of a building. He's going to kill himself. And if you can find that online, it's really excellent and a great example of of how these shows, you know, how that show worked. It was quite they half hour. A- half hour. Yeah. It's a very fun writing exercise to be able like it seems uh, like a, a fun challenge, like almost because sometimes when you're given certain limitations or uh, um, like confines to work within, it makes writing more enjoyable because like sometimes for me, the hardest thing about writing is 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 limitless options. And you don't really know where to go. But if you have like this intro with Alfred Hitchcock talking in an outro and you're tasked with the challenge of trying to fit a story within th- that confine, that that's that seems like such a uh, entertaining challenge. Yeah, it, it was great. And the other reason it was great was the, the producers themselves were limited by that. So they couldn't come in and just blow the whole thing up. Right. The note, mm-hmm. they were like, oh, <laughs> shit, we got to stay in the college form. And so so that that saved us a lot of nonsense that can definitely happen uh, in the yeah. development process. So yeah, it was good now, fun. This question is for, for the both of you and either one of you can take it first. Now, according to our research, because we do our research, uh, the first credit that you guys share together is in 1996 is dark man three die dark man die. How did you guys and me and begin working together? 
So in 1990, this was uh, just to, you know, your listeners may be interested. This was the golden age of the million dollar spec sale and by spec screenplay sale. So Shane Black and all these guys who are now, well, not all of them. He's mostly the only one um, got their career started by selling spec screenplays for they would get in these auctions among the studios and they'd sell for a million dollars. And so there were a bunch of these happening. And Mike and I were like, well, we want some of that and uh, we can write an action movies. And so we got they were they were mostly action, almost except for like uh, except for John Matson's milk money, milk money. And size and shape of breasts may vary from person to person. Uh, Why women talk. That Diane wrote, uh, it oh, was yeah. mostly yeah. Yeah. I know, like the, the last Boy Scout came out of that that deal with like Shane Black and stuff and uh, was originally going to be called Die Hard. <laughs> yep. Yep. Although, yes. <laughs> yeah. Wild time. And there were a bunch more that were never made, which is why that phenomenon ended. <laughs> but anyway, so we thought, well, let's try to let's try to manufacture something that we can sell that's very commercial. And so we got together. And now at that again, at that time, what people wanted, the studios wanted desperately was the next Die Hard. That was sort of the organizing principle of action movies. What's the next mm-hmm. Die Hard? And so we got together and and um, well, and keep in mind. We had been we had known each other for five or six or seven years at this point, and yeah. we spent a lot of time uh, noting each other to death about our own individual work, and so we were pretty familiar with critiquing each other, and we had a lot of respect for uh, not just for the work we had done as individuals and the feedback we got from each other, because it was super important to us essentially, and there were a one or two other people who were in like uh, writers rooms with us after we left UCLA, we wanted to keep that going where we would, you know, organize uh, weekly meetings at like a mall in century city or somewhere we'd all meet. And every week we'd give each other assignments, which kept us honest because, well, we'll get into the advice for, for your, uh, the, uh, your audience uh, members who are either writers or, want to want to be screen or tv writers about Mm -hmm. how that works but basically we had uh you know we were keeping each other honest and focused and so anyway go ahead michael i'm sorry yeah no that's 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 exactly right we we sort of skipped over a little bit part before we started writing we had known each other for some time we'd met in film school at ucla as Mike said, and we we met because I was taking two sleeping on someone's couch and taking two buses from North Hollywood to get to UCLA. And it was very uncomfortable. And I'd often be late or the bus would be late or whatever. And uh, we we had this one class and somebody said, oh, you know, I was complaining about, you know, again, r- rushing in late because of the bus schedule. And somebody said, oh, that guy lives in Toluca Lake. Aren't you in North Hollywood? I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, you should hit him up for rides. And, and he so did. I, I did. He did. And uh, that's and, how we met. Yeah. And that's how really we got to be got to be friends. And so um, anyway, so flash forward a few years and we've been helping kind of trying to help each other make our way. I got my first agent because Mike introduced me to his agent and um, et cetera. So that's generally the way it works. So anyway, so we got together and it was really a extra talk about an exercise, an exercise in manufacturing something that that was going to be commercial which is not usually which i don't advise (laughs) bringing writers to do at all uh but we thought well maybe we can maybe we can find some it's it it went a little deeper than that i mean we yes there was a mercenary aspect to it yeah sure and you know the fact that neither of us had any money and i certainly was swimming at that point and $40,000 $40,000 of student debt. Um, I did have my own apartment at that point, um, thanks to uh, student loans that I still hadn't paid off. But the, the fact is, we both really enjoyed those movies. Yes, yes. And we both were interested in writing, aside from the spec sale market uh, of something. And we'd spent a lot of time going to those movies together when they opened. And so we're like, you know, it felt it was very organic for us to try and write one together. Yeah, we when mm-hmm. like when die. I, I can tell you exactly when, when Mike talked about uh, um, 
Raiders earlier. I went to see Die Hard on opening night here in, at the Avco Theater in Westwood, and I sat through it like three more times. Uh, I was Good. so blown away by that film. I mean, it was it, it's and still probably oh, one of the, if not the greatest action script of all time. The movie is great also, but from a writing point of view and a construction point of view, it's flawless. And so, yes, we were definitely much, very much, uh, what would the word be? Um, in, you know, well inspired um, um, and uh, in, energized by the, what mm -hmm. could be done in this, in, in that genre, which we, we, you know, thought like, well, let's, let's do ours. So anyway, so we got together and talked about, well, what would ours look like? And the first, I'll jump over a lot, but the first, Thing and we talked about. Will, this will circle back to Die Dark Man Die, by the way. Yes, it will, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I trust I trust your ability to, to form a to form a story. So so what we face off was about, written first. Yeah, face off was written first. Oh, wow. oh, that's right, because it was written in like 1990, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you know that. Okay. okay. Ni yeah, 1990. And this so so the first so we talked first about, well, should it be die hard in a one of the many die hards ideas we had was die hard in a prison. And I had done a bunch of research about Attica, the Attica riots from the 70s. And we talked about, you know, does a guy go undercover into a prison and then he gets caught up in a riot and, you know, he has to defend himself. And it's like a real horror kind of movie situation. And and then Mike, you know, we kicked that around for a while. And then Mike said, well, not Attica, that long. Attica, <laughs> is, Attica is, yeah, it all took place over a long weekend. So it was pretty drunk. <laughs> so um, Mike said, well, Attic is kind of depressing, which it was. He goes, what about a prison in the future? And then when he mm. said that, it was like, oh, the mind, you know, the, it, it, it just mm. hit a groove instantly. And so then we started figuring out how to, how to what we would do. Well, we thought, well, OK, well, we want a good guy. Bruce Willis type goes into this prison. And why does he go in and what's it for? And he's going to get caught up in this you know, kind of like we knew right away we what we wanted to do was have him be uh, a persona non grata, right? So he, we, the audience knows he's a good guy, but everyone else thinks he's a, a bad guy and he's caught up in this nightmare where he can't, no one knows who he is and he has to fight for his life. And that was really the impetus that got got us into face, face off. But I, don't know that, I, I mean, it was after we'd, we'd also gone to a revival house of which, you know, Quentin Tarantino's New Beverly Cinema aside here in LA are unfortunately a really dying breed. Mm -hmm. They uh, uh, we went to Pasadena, I think it was, to see White Heat, which I, we'd seen before, both of us. But I love that movie, and it was really uh, Cagney's. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Cagney's uh, uh, swan song of playing a gangster. And there's a sequence in that. If you guys have seen White Heat, and if you haven't, please do. It's amazing. There's a sequence where uh, somebody has to go undercover in prison to uh, get some information out of Cagney, who's been arrested at this point, and he's incarcerated. And, uh, and, uh, and there's somebody who can make him, make the, F, make the undercover agent there. And so uh, it's, it's full of tension. It's really, really an exciting sequence. And that was, Michael, wasn't that in, somewhat inspiring yes. as well? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. By all means, it was. In fact, we, yes, White Heat was definitely an influence in that regard. Not Seconds, by the way. Neither of it seen, had seen Seconds uh, until well after uh, yeah. the, the face-off was uh, shot and wrapped and, and uh, you know. Okay, so that, yeah, I did see that. That's a uh, urban, cinematic urban legend. Mm -hmm. So we wrote the script in second half of 1990, the first draft of face-off. We went out to the market in early 1991, which is a whole other story. And hey, we back opted up, back up. Yeah. We, brought, we once we decided, figured out what the idea, which is one thing. One thing that we were struggling with was the 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 antagonist for the movie. We had we had settled pretty much on the hero and all that, but we were seeing all these movies that were coming out that weren't as good as Die Hard and didn't have a Hans Gruber and, and uh, you know, know one, doing one arm push-ups naked in a hotel room and threatening to conquer the world. And we're like, why can't the bad guy be as interesting as the good guy? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that was the light bulb moment when we both said, why can't the bad guy be the good guy? 
we once we had that going on and Michael filled this in in better way than I, I am doing right now. But uh, we we started scene carding um, out our our plot line and our character arcs. And uh, we did that in what, two days? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty we, fast. Had, we had the story. I mean, yes, the first draft is very different in in some ways than the movie you, you guys are familiar with. But but the the actual uh, a spine, the blueprint of the movie remained completely intact. Yeah, through, for, through the whole journey. Be, it be, we, we always looked at it as the it's a wonderful life of action films, because everything that you see in the first third or first half of the movie has resonance and pays off uh, in either macro or micro ways uh, as we uh, move toward the ending. That's one of the things that I really love about Face Off is that it's almost like you're getting two feature films in that where the plots have uh, the resolution. Um, the first, like the first half of the movie, is like a prison break plot, and then the second half, it, yeah, like you said, it's that payoff of all the uh, the emotional turmoil and, and tension that's set up in the first half, like. When you have uh, Nicolas Cage living, knowing like knowing how terrible of a person he is and how unpredictable, and you're stuck in prison, and uh, and that man is is sleeping with your wife and no, taking care I of your you, child, you're wrong. I and he, they're right. They did the exact right thing. Nicolas Cage was a better husband than John Travolta. <laughs> he was a better dad. I love that we're calling and him Nicolas Cage, even though it was John Travolta. <laughs> it's Nick. It was Nick. Okay. No, I'm talking about Castor very, Troy. Very, when Castor, Castor Troy, Troy yes. was home with John Travolta's wife, he was a better husband, a better dad. He, yeah. he beat up. He beat up Danny Masterson. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but it, great it, job, it, guys. It had, it had <laughs> fantastic <laughs> pacing, though. Danny uh, Masterson. But, but, but that was a con. I mean, again, that was a light bulb moment. That when we hit upon, well, let's have the good guy and the bad guy switch places. And again, Mike, right. Mike <clears throat> really said, "Hey, uh, yes, and they're better in each other's lives than the other." And then that, that's when it real. That's we basically could start writing after that. That once we did that, we we had. Once we, we did what, Mike? I missed once, that. Once you said that that y- y- you don't remember, but they're better in each other's lives. Once oh, they get in, mm-hmm. then we knew exactly what every we could write endlessly and did on this movie. But we always knew what the scenes, how the scenes would be sort of emotionally organized. That that was always going to be shot through all the scenes, and that still is. And that's the way it is in the movie too. To this. You know, still, I think that's what makes a good action film is when you have that emotional grounding, when you can, you know, when when the characters are emotionally grounded, the situation is uh, challenging your emotions. It gets you invested in a certain way where the action is just kind of like icing on the cake. Yeah, well, that's why one of the big, huge issues we had with studios and directors previous to John Woo was uh, the stakes. I mean. You know, one of the previous directors insisted that the bomb be about to go off at the climax of the movie. And Michael and I were like, really had to put our foot down. It's like, it's not about blue wire, red wire. The stakes are over the family. And uh, it was it. we had to fight really. Unfortunately, John Woo completely understood that because it's just boring to have another bomb go off. It, it, mm-hmm. it, and, not go off fact, and and uh, that's curious. right the bomb <laughs> doesn't go off because the bad guy has bigger ideas than just killing people in the original draft he was recruited to be a vice presidential candidate is it true that you got the uh and we're gonna get into some imdb trivia facts here because they they let us down a good portion of the times so we want to set the record straight on some things that are directly pertinent to you guys but I guess a good place to start is since we're talking about the inception of the idea for the movie and everything, uh, Mike, is it, is it true that uh, a friend that was in a hand gliding accident had surgery, had something to do with the, uh, uh, the <laughs> idea for the, you tell them, Mike, you tell them, you tell them the story about the hand gliding accident. No, you tell them. <laughs> no, somebody still has an answer. We can't so, talk about it anymore. <laughs> so the short answer is yes and no. What, what basically when we started writing it in 1990, 91, it, and it went out around town and so forth, and we, we did manage to set it up. 
there was a lot of pushback, understandably, about facial facial swaps, facial surgery. And people were like, this doesn't exist. It, you know, it's crazy. And it, and it is. Well, neither did fucking dinosaurs coming back to life. But here we are with Jurassic Park, one of the highest grossing films of all time. We're going to limit right. our movies well, exactly. to things that only and exist. I, I, I think yep. the story can now be told in its entirety, which is Mike invented this tale of the hang gliding accident as a go-to <laughs> anecdote when people, executives expressed doubt, Mike said, well, I know a guy who was in a hang gliding accident and had his face taken off and put back on. And, uh, and he looks, you know, he doesn't look perfect, but he looks, you know, close enough. And I, I think I got that right, Mike, please correct me if I got that wrong. Um, I'm but I can argue with what you just said. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. Uh, he's not going to argue, which he would if I got it wrong. So, yeah. So that was a created, um, sort of, you know, kind of anecdote to make this thing seem less implausible. Now, the interesting thing was it took so long for Face Off to be made. It really did happen to someone, though. Oh, it did. Oh, okay. okay. So okay. My, my memory was that it, it, it was kind of in, in, invented. But anyway, by the time it got made, it, it, it wasn't that far-fetched uh, technology. And within a couple of years of the movie coming out, they were doing facial transplants. So. And we had to do several interviews with plastic surgery magazines. But um, <laughs> the, 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 the real thing is, Michael and I made a vague initial attempt to pitch the story before we wrote it to our agents. And we were basically laughed out of the room. Yeah. That we'll it's ridiculous. It Don't write that. Come up with something that people will understand that makes sense. And but we were so passionate about it. We knew what we were doing. We thought we have to get this on paper or else nobody's going to get it. So we oh, sat down and wrote I, it. I, I'm going to close up on, on Die, Dark Man, Die. Uh, oh, good. So anyway, so we wrote <laughs> the script. We sold the script. It went into kind of development phase and then development hell. But in the meantime, our agents were sending it. The, the script made the rounds in town. And one day we got a call that Sam Rainey's company wanted to meet with us. Sam wanted to meet with us. Um, and again, this is sort of a similar thing to the Alfred Hitchcock. Universal was like, hey, Darkman made some money, but let's make some, let, you know, let's try to just mine, yeah, the, mine the title for direct to DVD. Yeah, we want to make more. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, without doing the big theatrical release, is there money mm -hmm. to be made in these home videos, direct to home video? That was a sort of maverick idea in 1991 mm -hmm. to do original stuff direct for home. And so <laughs> we went and met with Sam Raimi and, and he had read the script and he basically just said, oh, you guys are hired. Yeah, I mean, this was awesome. like, was this the only time that ever happened we went in? We were like obviously thrilled to meet with Sam Raimi who was prepping Quick and the Dead at the moment, which is a totally yeah. underrated film. And uh, and he's we were started to sort of pitch some ideas. And he goes, oh, I trust you guys. Um, you're hired if you want to do it. Uh, we'll just have the everyone figure out the contracts. And we we drove off the universe a lot. We were like, wow, that's <laughs> that so nice. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, so, so we did write uh, uh, Die Dark and Die, as you can now tell, came after was was actually we were hired on the basis of face off. It just got produced first. It's That's kind good. of the same movie anyway. <laughs> and I had a question. If one, either one of you can take this, and I, I must know, we didn't have a chance to ask this before because we didn't know we we're going to be talking to the writers. Which one of you writ, writ down that Castor Troy should look, lick John Travolta's daughter's side of her face in that film? That big tongue lick on the side of that young girl's face. She looks so frightened at the end of that film. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, my understanding was that was Nick uh, uh, kind of in... John. in Sort of embodying the character. I don't. That was. I don't know if that was in the script, but it might have been. Hold on, guys. Hold on, John. I'm feeling a... something here. You know what? I take that back. In the oh. script, I think he sticks his tongue in her ear. Oh, oh yeah. So he, he, he dialed yeah. it back. Yeah. Oh. He stuck his tongue in her ear, but Nick changed it to licking her, licking her. Because that's much more acceptable. There we the, go. Things become a lot more real once <laughs> casting is done. Yeah. Right, because I had Milo licking Jim Carrey's ear. When he's dreaming of Cameron Diaz in the mask. Uh, yeah. So we might as well steal from ourselves, right? 
there. Oh, uh, yeah. See, I, yeah. See, we would have never got there. See, boom. All right. We're going to launch into a few um, a few of those trivia facts from IMDb. And, and these are, feel free to just do true or false if you want to elaborate or have a have a particular story that, that one of these bring up. Feel free. The first, uh, the first fact is, fact, John Travolta asked the writers if they were making fun of him with the ridiculous chin line. And they explained that, that Castor was such a narcissist that he would hate having anyone else's face true nice that's true. that scene was about to be shot and we were summoned to uh jt's trailer to discuss that line our response was john look you are without question one of the most famously handsome men on earth the audience knows that but inside you're not john travolta with the famous cleft chin and all that, you are Caster Troy. And Caster Troy, as you guys just said, is an excessive narcissist and believes he is the best looking person on earth. And so this face does not suit him. And so <laughs> when you say that line, we're pretty sure the audience is going to be laughing with you and not at you. Right. And, and, Michael, what did John say after we pitched that to him? Yeah, you know, he 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 got it. He, you know, I I mean, I think he got what I think he knew what we were, he certainly knew what we were going for, but he wasn't a hundred percent sure. Oh, okay. Come that's, on, that's Ch- right. chin up, buddy. Yeah. Chin up. <laughs> Clef right. chin up. Clef, all right. So the second one here, true or false, the scene with Adam listening to Over the Rainbow on his uh, headphones was John Woo's idea and not part of the original script. True or false? Uh, that's true. That's totally true. Yeah. Okay. John originally wanted uh, one little tiny sidebar on this. The, what John wanted to use was Puff the Magic Dragon. Uh. And, um, and apparently uh, the producer came down grumbling one day, shaking his head in disbelief because he, he said the Peter, Paul and or Mary, whoever controlled the rights to it, wouldn't wouldn't license the rights because he still believed that that he could get a movie made of the song one what? day, even though the, <laughs> even though it was 30 years old. And who knows? Maybe he will. But they were very right. put out by that. And then they couldn't get the Judy Garland version either. So yeah, the Judy Garland estate would not license it for this. Uh, violent movie. I guess they must have sent the script or something. It was, it was serendipitous to have Olivia Newton John singing yeah. on a jo- another John Travolta film. Was, yeah, uh, I know. We we love that circle. imagery too. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was good. But that's true. Yeah, right. Ri- writers and symmetry. It's like uh, uh, if anything gets a writer off, it's symmetry. It's it's nice, like you know, circling yeah. back and. Yeah. Yeah. The studio wanted John Woo to take the slash out of the title, but he kept it in because he didn't want people to think it was a hockey movie. Is that mine, Michael? Yes, that's yours. Take it away. (laughs) I thought so. Okay. So when we came up with the idea that that would be the name of the film and we simultaneously to that put the slash in, we were always terrified that they were going to take the slash out which was always a problem for us because it just seemed weird. And the whole concept was so weird. So Mm -hmm. we went behind the scenes uh, while we were in prep for like a fucking year, I guess. Uh, And we went to, you know, because we were now working on doing rewrites on the lot. We had our own trailer. We went to the production designer, the cinematographer, the costume department, publicity, and we just because a couple times, a few times memos had come out and the slash wasn't in there. It was either a hyphen or just two words. And sometimes with the word off, not even capitalized. So um, so we went to every department and we complained quietly to all of them, insisting that the slash be put in because we wanted to inoculate everyone to the idea. We wanted mm-hmm. everyone to get used to it. Well, sure. Then came time that the, the, uh, we were shooting. It was a six month shoot and we were shooting the movie and there were um, there were uh, rumblings from the head heads of the studio that it, we couldn't do it, that the wow. slash was confusing, that uh, marquees, uh, movie marquees, 
Uh, this is before, I guess, Nip Tuck and Crazy Beautiful and whatever. Yeah. Um, th that didn't exist. They couldn't put it sideways. So uh, I did you was it I was not there. No, this was you solo. I was summoned into a meeting <laughs> where it was me against like 10 people at Paramount asking me to defend this slash. By the way, there's an article in Entertainment Weekly, things we learned this summer. And that slash, I think, is in there uh, as an article. But uh, yeah, so I was summoned in there. Michael, for some reason, couldn't be there. And I went on and on about metaphors and J Joseph Campbell and and how the it's it's sort of a uh, it's it's yin yang and it's it's the slash is separating like a dagger separating good and evil and et cetera et cetera et cetera. I wasn't winning anybody over, and then finally <laughs> I just like put my hands up in the air and said, "Look, without that slash, people are going to think this is a hockey movie." That's all it took. Oh, we uh, could lose money. We <laughs> could lose. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, really. Now you're talking their language. <laughs> and then, of course, there was the whole issue during production where we heard rumblings that the studio wanted to change the name of the movie altogether away from Face Off into something like Doppelganger or something. Sound and like it wasn't forward. just for the German market. Good. We, again, went behind the scenes while we were shooting the loft action sequence. Is that right, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, yeah this is Mike, Michael, you take over on this. Well, well, uh, Mike, you'll have to jump in if I forget something. So it, as it just by coincidence, we got to started hearing the rumblings that they were wanted to change the title. And we were on the set and um, they were shooting all that stuff. And so, of course, all the all the actors were there. And somehow it came up in front of Nicolas Cage. That no, we they, went to him. Oh, we went. to. OK, there you go. That that explains it that they were wanting to change the title. And <laughs> Nicolas Cage said and this is on the set like they're about to shoot. And Nicolas Cage said, don't worry, after this, after tonight, we didn't know what he was talking about, because after tonight, they won't be able to change the title. And we were like, uh, OK. And he goes on and sh that was the night he shot that scene where he's on drugs. With Nick he Cassavetes. Goes, I'd like to take his his face off. I wish there was footage still existed because that went on for oh, like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. Hammer rolling. John Rue just loved it and just let them go at it. Face off, face off, face off, my face off, your face off. I mean, they just had a blast riffing on all of that. And of course, only a little tiny part of it remains in the movie. But once he did that, that was it. They just they just committed to it. We never heard it again. <laughs> it's always <laughs> fun for writers to bury, you know, kind of bury the title into your dialogue. Um, yeah. I, I finally watched Nightmare Alley last night and they do it very quietly. Um, but uh, I mean, it's buried in a longish speech. Yeah. If, if you could sneak in a good roll credits moment, that that's always fun. Yeah. We, we had it right up there. Uh, Nick I, H. I'm just sure it, Mike. it was in your face. <laughs> I'm yeah. replaying the whole thing in my mind. In, this, just... in the script, he only says it like once. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of think he's weird and they sort of move on. But Nick just made a big meal out of it. Nick has Why, do this well, happening? Why do I see this happening this way? They go up to Nicolas Cage. They, he found out that they were going to change the name. He's like, oh, yeah, that, watch this. You know what I'm saying? Like you gave him that motivation. So that, that's pretty that's pretty dope, guys. Now, let me ask you this. There has been some jokes online about I even said it in our review of the film, which you guys haven't seen yet. Mike Werb joked that the bomb had the longest lag time slash latency in movie history, just long enough to keep the plot going. <laughs> I feel like that's true. <laughs> when did I joke about that? I, I we we said that, but I don't remember when I said it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, wow. I, IMDb has got your phone tapped. There. <laughs> well, that's the to, back to the point we talked about earlier. Totally true. That we knew we needed something huge to motivate someone removing their face and getting replaced with the serial killer, the killer of your your uh, son, you know, of your child. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so we knew that was important, but we also knew it was also important that the movie not be about a bomb. And so, yes, right. it, everyone's waiting for it to go off. And, you know, screw you, uh, uh, people who think you can predict what's going to happen in this movie. It's not <laughs> going to go off ever. John finally got the dance. You know he was up for that dance and scene. John was having the time of his life dismounting that bomb. He was oh, just yeah. like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
Oh, I think he it's in his contract. He's got to dance in every movie. At just least for a little one, bit. Just one time, a little one time. He does it again when he's uh, first meets Janie, i.e. Jamie, his daughter. And oh, my God. He got a brand new bag. And yeah. we loved when he did that. Oh, he was. You got something I want. Actor. We were so delightful on set. Very yeah. sweet people. So they had a problem with the name of the film. They didn't have a problem with a grown man pretending to lean over to what he thought was his daughter. Or she thought that was her dad reaching over to get a cigarette with her in her underwear. They had no problem with that. Well, yeah. another another defying expectations there because we see him fondling that chorus, that girl in the choir at the very beginning. And it's yes. the same character inside. And so you think that, but nope, we flip it. He's actually, and they they have a bonding moment right away. Not, you know, it's 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 horrible in that it's sort of sexually charged what you're expecting him to do no mm -hmm. he wants a cigarette from her don't tell mom so now they have a secret and he it's Great part it's the first man. step in him being a better father uh than the distant man that she's known her whole life thank you from uh, the writer thank you i have to say uh the, this is off topic from the segment ring but i just i don't want to forget it this you guys did such an excellent job when you I, when you're talking about the son dying and wearing the face of the person that killed your son. You did such a great job of setting it. Like a great movie relies on great stakes that are set up effectively, and you guys did such a good job with that. With with just setting up this nightmare situation. Looks like you're gonna be in here for the next hundred years. <laughs> that you just long for the the. A good guy to escape from and make things right. Really good. The script, and this I think is actually you, you brought this up before. The script that's presented to John Woo was set in the future, but Woo suggested changing the setting to the present to focus on the dramatic and psychological elements of the storyline. Um, I know you guys said it was set in the future, but was that was that um, at John Woo's uh, like suggestion to, to bring it to yes, the present? Yes, I do. Okay, <laughs> so 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 this this requires a little unpacking, a truth telling. Yeah, a little, a little too tough. So, so the, the original script that we sold, again, because we were so nervous about the face swap aspect of it, we wrote a movie that was very futuristic, 100 years in the future, uh, had a lot of other futuristic elements that made it literally unproducible or, or like the most expensive movie ever made. But we still set it up at Warner Brothers. And it, it didn't really go anywhere. It didn't go anywhere at Warner Brothers. We did our drafts and they really weren't. That's another topic. But it ended up sort of like sitting there for a couple of years while the option was running out. And in those couple of years, we had a lot of time to talk about it. We had a lot of time to talk about what we would have done differently, what would be better, what would be more commercial. We just rummaged around for a while about it. And in that time, we thought, you know what? We 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 did, we overdid it. We kind of overthought this. We we really don't need. We didn't need to do be so far flung. We could have done this as a secret program. The more realist real it was, the better it was going to be. So instead of hiding the idea, we want we you know we we thought we should really just embrace it and go at it from a real personal point of view, and we'll get better actors that way anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So once we got the option back and we set it up at Paramount and we had a meeting with their producers, we went in and they said, this ne also never happened in our whole life. They, they were like, what do you guys want to do with this? Yeah, you know, we've Warner, had Warner Brothers had repeatedly when, you know, look, Joel Silver is his incredible track record producing movies. But it was basically the notes from from Silver Pictures were. You know, uh, you know, action scene, uh, glass uh, crashes right. every ten pages. And it, and when we met with Steve Ruther and Michael Douglas, who produced the film uh, with David Permit, the, it was literally we were like Michael just said we were kind of blown away by uh, it was Michael Douglas I think who said I've read every draft. What what's tell me the story that you guys want to tell. And then he was like, we don't need all this futuristic stuff. Yeah, we said we want to get rid of all that because for so many reasons. And and they got very excited, too, because they were like they were afraid to bring that up. Like we were going to be resistant, not that they couldn't have replaced us. But when we said the first thing we said was, look, I, we know what you bought, but we want to get rid of all that. We want to focus on the people we you know we want to make it more intimate and they were like, yeah, great. Go. That's what we want to. Um, didn't Michael Douglas say? Yeah, because you know what, guys, 
this is a this is a psychological thriller disguised as an action movie. Right. And he goes, I'm a producer on this on this movie. But if I'm putting my actor's hat on, I'm telling you this. Actors get to play good and evil in the same movie when it's identical twins. You guys have an opportunity to to get great actors because it's not identical twins. It's something else. Yeah. It's something we've mm-hmm. never seen before. And uh, this is more of an Edgar Allan Poe uh, kind of story, he said. So, so yeah. So flash right? forward. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So flash forward. The movie's made. John Woo makes the movie. And after the movie, we see an article from John saying uh, that he was the one who took out all the futuristic stuff, which he and we were like, huh? He never, ever saw a draft of all the futuristic stuff from our point of view, because it was all gone by the time he came on the movie. Well, we asked his partner, producing partner, Terrence Chang, who's been with him forever. And Terrence started to laugh and explained that back, we didn't, we never knew this, but back when the script was at Warner Brothers in the early 1991, Joel Silver went to Hong Kong with a stack of all his scripts, because that was the moment when Hong Kong cinema was starting to kind of get to be better known worldwide. And so Joel Silver, as Mike says, brilliant producer said, oh, I'm going to get me a great Chinese director. And he went to Hong Kong with all his scripts that were in development. And he was basically saying, John Wu, I've seen A Better Tomorrow. You can direct any of these you want. And he read Face Off. We didn't know that. John had read Face Off back before we ever met him. And it was completely futuristic. And he said, I like this but it's too futuristic. Well, we never, that never filtered down to us. You know, Joel Silver, I'm sure never even remembered. But when John got the script again in 1994, it, all that stuff was out. He was like, oh, they took my note. That's a, that, I, that's that's funny, but that's like a perfect, uh, that, that's a perfect example of the synergy between the writers and directors. So anyway, so that explained why John, and to this day probably still takes credit for taking the futuristic stuff out of the movie. But it was, again, it was like you say, it was synchronicity. You, you guys were on the same page even before you were in the same library. Yeah, yeah. In an early draft of the script, Archer went to Caster's mother's place to hide out. The writers <laughs> wanted the mother to be played by Elizabeth Taylor or Jack Nicholson in drag. True or false? True. True. All true. Absolutely. We Those were the two actors we were very keen on on playing that role. And it ended up, uh, there was just no room for that scene or that sequence. But we really felt like it would be, it ended up being turning into the loft sequence, but having nowhere else to turn, we thought it was, and we still believe it would have been amazing to have him because the whole movie, as you guys have noted several times in this conversation is about balance and counterbalance. Mm. And so having nowhere else to turn, having escaped Erewhon prison, he has, he's hunted, the most hunted man on earth. Where does he go? He goes to Castor's mother's house where she is a very strange person uh, who I think in one of the drafts has, has a incestuous relationship with her son. Um, but, but he spends the night in his nemesis's uh, uh, bedroom, which has oh, not yeah. changed, so yeah. has not changed since high school, since you know, since he lived there. And so, our hero gets insight not just in the behavior of this horrible mother, but also the totems of Castor Troy's childhood. And we learn a lot of backstory about who he was and why he became what he became. Unfortunately, it's not in the film, but you know, it helped us inform everything about him anyway, but yeah, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly correct. And we went through through different versions of what the mother was like, but yeah, it did not, it unfortunately fell out of the script at a certain point. We did hear in script magazine, we got interviewed by like script magazine or something like that. And um, the person who interviewed us had recently somehow she knew Jack Nicholson or or had a meeting with him. And she actually, she told us, oh, I told Jack Nicholson that uh, you guys wanted him to play 
the mother, Travolta's mother, uh, Castro Troy's mother in drag. And he got a big kick out of it, apparently. He got, he thought that was freaking hilarious. So, uh, but, um, so that would have been fun. Here's a question for you guys. Can you guess what Castro Troy's mother's first name is or was in our script? I'm sure you can guess. One guess each. Damn it. I did not know he was going to do yeah, this too. Know. And I now that's... Okay. Well, all did right, you get right. our memo of questions we were going to ask you? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I am going to uh, Jackie. Oh, very good. But I'll wrong. say uh, <laughs> shit. That was, uh, that's that's all I had. Oh, and I feel uh, my, my head just got. All right, I'll hot. give you a clue. <laughs> think, continue to think Greek mythology. Medusa. No. <laughs> oh well, that's a good guess. It is a good guess. Uh, Helen. Helen, Helen, of Troy. Helen of Troy. Oh, oh! damn it. it. Damn it. I love Greek mythology. Damn it. I really like the idea that like uh, what makes a great antagonist is when you tempt the audience to uh, to feel bad for them or at least to to understand them. I could see the I could see why scenes like that would have been. And like you said, that putting a magnifying glass on the contrast between the two. Characters. Can you imagine going in that bedroom that they were talking about having and seeing the two bunk beds from Caster and his brother? Like this, like this whole thing is taking another that 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 guys. I wish they would have let you keep that. We need a writer's cut. Fuck a director's cut. We need writer's cut. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. Now, the writer cited white heat and seconds as influences on the plot. But I heard you earlier in the interview say that you guys didn't see seconds to like way after this. Is is this yeah, correct or no? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Cause I didn't want to dispel that rumor. Cause sometimes people will see, see stuff and say, Oh man, they took that from that. Like, no, people have ideas all the time. So, you know, you got to put them on paper and everything. So seconds is a great film, by the way, it's an amazing movie, but yeah, it was not, it was not on our radar at all. No. Uh, Although my father what? did run into John Frankenheimer. And uh, who said he really liked the movie? <laughs> did I tell, ever tell you that, Michael? No, I don't know. What did, he, did he, Frankenheimer like the movie? Yeah, my father had a, ha, maybe she's still a client. My father has a, had a client who had a, a post production house in Santa Monica. And Fra Frankenheimer was in post on one of his last movies. And he, saw, he really liked the film. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Anyway, that's cool. cool. The uh, the last uh, fact here is um, IMDb states that Nicolas Cage considers Face Off to be one of his uh, or his, actually just his favorite film that he's worked on, provided that that is true. How does that how would that make you guys feel to know that you penned the 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 script for Nicolas Cage's favorite film? And I'm like of all the actors to make that statement, I feel like it's more complimentary coming from Nicolas Cage because he's made like. Yeah, he he's he's comparing this to like three thousand other films. Yes, this year five thousand. Thank you, there yeah. you <laughs> right? The well, man is working. Well, I I had never heard that before. Of course, I'm humbled I either and flattered if he felt that way. I will say this: shooting the film itself, the production of the film itself, which was as Mike said, was six months long, is very difficult. It was a very happy, harmonious set. Um, John, they, they, John, both John Travolta and Nicolas Cage worshipped John Woo. John Woo was, is, um, you know, he was just the rock at the center of all of this kind of like chaotic storm. The production was, was very, very smooth. I mean, look, there's always money issues and stuff like that, but there was no ego around these guys. Uh, they were given latitude to create with John, they, you know, they felt included in the creation part of it. They were given freedom to do their thing. John Lo Wu loves actors. He loved them. Um, it, it was just, it was for a movie of that size and that complexity and that much money. Um, it was, it was weirdly bereft of tension and anxiety. There was never like the studio coming down and screaming and stopping production. Mm -hmm. There was none of that. And um, so that was, I think, very, uh, very helpful. And I think part of that reason the main reason of that was because, of course, Travolta and Cage were happy. They were happy yeah. on the set. They felt taken care of. They they felt very connected to John Woo and heard. But the other, I think, important part was there were no rewrites. There was no chaos around the script. 
the script well, other the script. than the climax but yeah. yeah i mean we had to do some some changes around block you know production issues we had but 13 like- days to shoot the climax yeah and uh we they one day they came to us and we had to cut it down to five wow. yeah so so there were challenges like that but it wasn't like every day these guys were getting new scenes and new pages you know, that were taking the store that they had no insight where they okay. came from. There wasn't any of that. So it was a very stable for a movie of that size. It was a very sort of stable undertaking. And since most people still didn't understand it, we were required to be on set at all times. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. So is it John? Is it Cass? I just, that, that's uh. a perfect That's a perfect segue, actually, because the next question is regarding the complexity of the script and all of the moving pieces. Even when we were taking the notes on it for this episode, it became challenging to kind of like, like, okay, this is Nicolas Cage, but it's like when you're, when, uh, when you're writing something like this, it's so complex with, with so many different parts that, how do you like what what did your process look like keeping everything in order? And I'm talking about like down to the 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 micro level of like how you how you organize the names of characters in yeah, the script so it's not the to the actors. Yeah, we we very did, good I, question. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um and we and we debated how to do it. We weren't exactly sure, but what we what we landed on very fortuitously for us, as it turns out, was we whoever they were, we just called them that name. We we did regardless of what what face they were wearing. Nice. So we were of course always able to keep track of that. But if you just open, of course, the movie was shot essentially kind of kind of in and out of sequence. And you know, of course, you know, you would go to a location once. So for example, when John Travolta was being filming all the FBI office parts, he was both going to be both Caster and Archer in those scenes. But they were all shot like over the same period of time. He's in the same wardrobe. They're shooting all out of sequence in that location. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it got kind of confusing sometimes. He wouldn't necessarily know which of his people, you know, in, in... in the confusion of the daily hustle, he, he always knew, of course, what character. Yeah. But not always. Yeah. Not so always. anyway, so yeah, there were, there were a few like times that. when both of them were like, "Which one am I?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, especially at the climax. Yeah, at the climax. Well, you, didn't the original draft, Michael, have us say it was? You know, when you're writing your character and you're typing on Final Draft or whatever you guys use, we use uh, at the time, I don't know. We Word probably start. you probably wrote it in WordStar. Or WordStar, yeah. Early software program, but it we we would have uh, uh, J- Sean Archer and then a parenthetical as Caster. Yeah. God, that had to be tedious. Right. Oh yeah. It, yeah, oh. which it, it made the read really Clumbers. cumbersome, and so we took it. We took all that out. We just and we just kept the names. The only way I was able to do it was I, I called them pre-op archer, post-op archer. Like that's the only way I was going to do it. Like pre-op, post-op for the surgery. Yep. And we would maybe in description, if there was this like a tense, I, I can't say to point to a specific part, but maybe we would say, oh, so Sasha sees Archer, but of course she's, you know, she thinks it's Caster. So like we might do mm. that kind of thing here and there, but not very much. We just left it the way it was. I want to ask a quick question because he's going to be too afraid to ask it. I and only because uh, Mike, you brought this up when like there was going to be a little part of this incestuous thing that happened. There you is, are stuck on the incestuous. No, he <laughs> he brought it up, not me. The sister, Sasha, and the brother. Was there anything that should have been hinted at? Something was a little different going on there. <laughs> I was totally between Gina Gershon and Nick Cassavetes. <laughs> so be it. That we'll was not it in this. That was not in the script. No. Okay. <laughs> Look, actors. The actors are doing their actors thing. They they all want to you know to command the screen, and in fact, we they had to really uh, at the climax, kind of kneel, kind of like uh, put a sort of uh, sit on Gina Gershon for a moment because she wanted to show up at the climax with her head shaved. Oh, yeah. She came to us. Yeah. And she was like, I want to shave my head in solidarity with my dead brother, Nick Cassavetti's character. And we're like, oh, that's a great idea. We'll run it by John Woo. But you know what he's going to say? And she's like, what? He's going to say that if you come in that room in, into that shot, which is the Mexican standoff at the church, if you come in looking like that, the scene's all about you. Yeah. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and John was like, John Wu was like, no, 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 no. Oh man. No, what, no, what no, no. What is that like for you guys as writers? Because you kind of like, I, I imagine it's not the first time you've come uh, at uh, like toe to toe with the ego of an actor that thinks they understand the character or the story more than you do. Uh oh, here comes Mike. Mike can Mike can talk about Nick Cage. No. <laughs> yes, go ahead. <laughs> Which story? The one at the at the climax. Remember, he he was upset. He was upset because we we were upset. I don't know if I want to get into that. Okay, that, that's okay. It's if you don't want to, yeah, we're, it's uh, we're not, so you don't have to. We're not here to throw we mud. Had, we yeah. had a very, very good. Yeah. It is true. We had a very good relationship with Nick, who ad libbed, uh, you know, a healthy amount, and all to the benefit. There was one scene where he and Alessandro Nivola ad libbed a scene, which, in our opinion, uh, hurt the film because it had to do with the substitute backstory for those kids, those brothers growing up. And that was literally on a six day shoot. It was the only day both of us were not there. And we struck that set and had to move on. And so uh, uh, it caused a little bit of an issue with us and we were shooting some other scene and uh, Nick got in my face about it. And uh, uh, you know, about, what they had what they had ad libbed and it, it it's not like we came to blows but everyone was everyone was staring at us and it was very uncomfortable john travolta who doesn't like any conflict took michael cleary aside and just left the set and uh t- you know and it's t- i don't know what they talked about and i was left there with i think jerry bruckheimer was there a lot of people showed up whenever you know, in the heads of Paramount, whenever they were shooting to get scenes together, they're not in the, the they're not in the movie that often yeah, yeah, at, at, mm-hmm. at the same time. But right. they were that day, and so I just told Nick that, look, you know, let's have I'll go to your trailer at lunch and we'll hash it out what happened with that one sequence. And I have to say, to Nick's credit, although you know it looked like it was going to be a, a big issue, and I thought my career was going to end. Uh, I went to Nick's trailer. I explained to him why I didn't, why we didn't care for the ad lib those two guys did regarding their backstory and that how it hurt the film ultimately, because now we don't have one. And Nick, you know, I have to say, I just love him because he like, he kind of burst into tears. And if I only knew, you know, and I'm sorry. And, you know, and I, I still didn't know whether it was just crocodile tears because you know, he's an incredible actor. <laughs> but he, was, he was so gracious and kind to us. Uh, he, he really and, was. Yeah. Very generous. That That's interesting, isn't it? When like, because a, a good movie relies on the, the cast uh, kind of embracing the passion that the writers have when they, they create the story and then the, the cast and the crew comes involved and to, the, the movie is uh, the, the great movies are great because everybody had that same passion and embraced it. But at the same time, it's like it, it, when that, when that passion kind of uh, expresses itself in ways like that, where it's, it's easy to look at as like this, this dude's just trying to run off with my story, but he's just somebody that like you created characters that are so, that are so uh, dimensional that it, it made him care about it to the extent that he felt like he knew them too. And there, there was a funny coda to that story, which was like the next oh, right. day, the, ne- the next day we were on the set and uh, an executive from the studio, essentially the company came down and we were the like, same day, the same day. And, and oh, well, Mike should tell the story because it's what happened to him. Yeah, uh, You tell it. Okay. So the guy comes down the set and we're thinking, Oh shit, we're going to get yelled at. At this point, the movie, the shoot was almost over. So we really weren't be afraid of being fired, but you never know. You never know. And the guy came up and Mike was like, oh, God, I'm going to get I'm going to get ringed out now by this guy. And he came up and said, so I heard about, uh, you know, yes, your conversation with Nick, this thing with Nick earlier. And Mike was like, yeah, yeah, it's always he, and the guy goes, listen, can you tell him about this note? I have to, I want to give him about something else, this other thing uh, that I, we don't, we kind of wanted to change. <laughs> Mike was like, no, 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 no. You tell him. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Cause they were all impressed that Mike was actually able to go and have a conversation. You know, they're terrified. Here's the thing. And understandably, I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem like I'm dissing these guys. 
uh, not the, mm-hmm. the executives and stuff, because, you know, every day is a, is a fortune to shoot. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they don't know always what kind of state of mind the actor is going to be in. And so if they look the wrong way, like we were told at the beginning, you know, don't if, if you guys are having an issue with the movie or something like that, don't complain in front of Travolta. It's, it's going to make him feel insecure about the movie. And then that's bad for everybody. And so yeah. we kind of learned that it's like be very careful around these guys, because if, if you somehow are the straw that broke the camel's back emotionally that day, they might go in their trailer for two fucking days and not come back. That never happened wow. on Face Off. Ne- never. Mm-hmm. But it does happen. And, and that's a catastrophe for the production. I mean, people do get fired for that. And so they're, they're, the people tend to kind of tiptoe around the sort of the, 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 the sort of big guns involved because they don't want to ever take the chance uh, of of doing anything that will slow the process. So yeah, yeah, yeah you have to be a little bit, you do have to walk on eggshells a little bit. And so they were very impressed that Mike was actually able to have a functional uh, creative conversation with another artist on the set about the quality of the film that, 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 you know, that they were blown away by that. But, you know, I I will say this, you know, Mike earned that, by the way, that's the part he's not saying. Being on the set every day, being a resource, being, you know, uh, complimenting Nick on, because Nick did a lot of very important ad-libbing that we were able to then fold into the movie later when we, we, we shot scenes with Travolta as the bad guy. We were able to like- And vice versa when he grabs the girl's ass in the beginning, as you said, later on in the movie, when he's Travolta, he grabs his secretary's ass. Well, that wasn't in the script until Nick did that on the set with the young girl. We said, oh, we got to find a place for him to do it as the other act, as the other actor. Mm -hmm. And there was tons of that shit. It was important to remind the audience constantly that they were different people, despite the fact that it was the same actor playing that role. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. So, but you know, so we did actually have a very uh, productive um, relationship. Um, and look, those guys are, you know, they were movie stars. They're movie stars now. They were movie stars then. It's yeah. intimidating. It was really mm-hmm. as as friendly as they all were, and as uh, available. And Travolta was just a riot to be around. Just he was very happy, which is not always the case. These guys are not always happy on movies, but it makes all the difference. And, but it's still intimidating as hell. I mean, you're sitting with freaking John Travolta, you know, telling yeah. him, Oh no, you, you know, you're, 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 you don't worry. You're, you're handsome. Me, you're <laughs> handsome. You're fine. Keep telling him, keep that motivation up there. Yeah. Keep I mean, motivation. not to mention that if a, if a person that's important enough walks away from an altercation like that, feel in a certain way, it could cost you, the career yeah yeah, yeah 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 i wanted to ask you guys this is there anything you guys changed from the original draft that you wish you hadn't in hindsight for me it's just about the mother the scene we talked about the sequence mm-hmm. with the mother and then i guess the scene that uh that got cut where travolta spends the where uh, yeah. joan allen kicks travolta out of the bedroom when she he's promised her that he's done with this he's taking a desk job and now he's going undercover and can't tell her what it is and then he goes into um their child their deceased child's bedroom and and cries and they were like uh, we don't nobody wants to see john travolta cry in a movie we're like well we do and they're yeah, like, he was oh, great. He's too bad. Know. He was great in that scene. I, that might turn up in the. That might be on a DVD. It is. It's on. It's a, it's a, it's in the a, the deleted scenes. Oh, it is. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, that guy kind of. We were. You guys wanted the next Die Hard, right? You don't remember John McClane crying to uh, Al Pal about <laughs> Hey, pal. Yeah, but you know what? You got to remember that the first twenty, the everything in the first thirty minutes of that movie is to justify this insane. Decision Correct. is to yeah, sell right. that decision. Everything. Oh, of, oh sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go on. No, please. Uh, well, speaking of that, to your right uh, audience of of you know some whatever percentage of your audience's uh, writers, that was another thing that we had to do. It wasn't just the bomb uh, that could would motivate it. Yes, that that was fine. It made sense. They were going to kill a bunch of Supreme Court justices at the L.A. Convention Center. But the other thing was we had to sell the surgery. 
And by selling the surgery, we couldn't just go right into the surgery. We had to have an right. earlier sequence. So Michael and I, I think Michael found something oh, yeah. uh, uh, about um, the fact that they had grown an ear, human ear, using uh, uh, cells onto the, the side of a mouse. Right. Like a and mouse. We, we, we had video of that, and we showed that to the studio, and we said, look, we need one step before the big surgery. And right. that's why in the opening sequence, the FBI agent Loomis gets his ear blown off. And mm. then we see that, and that that's the buy-in for the audience. Oh, they don't know necessarily about the facial surgery at this point, but they do know that, that this ear can be replaced. And I think, Michael, isn't there, a, I mean, you guys have seen the movie more recently probably than we have, but um, isn't there a moment where Travolta looks at Loomis and doesn't know which ear it is? Oh. It's been replaced? That was in the script, certainly. Yes, oh. yeah, because Dr. Hogue, Dr. Walsh says, you probably can't even tell which ear it is. Right. And he, and he can't, there was like one moment. I don't know if that ever made it onto screen. Oh, I don't either. And of course it was done very differently in the movie. It was done with laser beams or whatever, which yeah. we were like, huh? The, cra the crazy mean? thing is, is that I, I don't I believe need, I, well, and I don't need, I did believe it, but I didn't need to believe it to enjoy the movie. Right. Like, like I'm, I'm signed on for what that, what that, the situation that that surgery creates. Uh, I like to see John Travolta be Nicolas Cage and Nicolas Cage be John Travolta. And then the stakes with the family that's set up, like I, I'm willing to suspend belief for the sake of because it's it's such a great instrument in telling such an effective story like it's almost shakespearean i mean even it was the attention to detail for me when john travolta uh, uh, goes down the street to see the house but he goes like six houses down too far he was like oh okay yeah. like it's those little <laughs> things that people like um we keep hearing whispers about a possible sequel written by the vhs and abc's of death writer director simon barrett have you heard anything about that yeah, um, what we heard was I thought it was um, the Kong versus Godzilla director. Yeah, it was the Kong, it was the Kong versus Godzilla director who kind of made this announcement came out right before the movie Kong versus Godzilla came out. And by the way, that's that's a pretty common gambit in show business when uh, you know a director or actor or somebody they have a movie coming out and they're not exactly sure how it's going to do uh, mm -hmm. in the weeks ahead of time they will flood the trades with how busy they are and what their next project is and how great their career is going and all that stuff. And that, that's a pretty common phenomenon. And so, the, so we were as surprised as anybody when that news hit and we did speak to the producer, David permit, who didn't, you know, didn't was, who we love dearly. He's a, just a great guy. Um, so, he, but he couldn't say too much about it specifically. He just said, it's a great idea. The script's coming in. I really think it's going to be great. But then we never heard a single peep after. So we don't know if the script ever came in or if it didn't work or or what. But we haven't heard a peep. But when you guys are creating a story like that, like putting a, a movie like like you create face off, you put it out there. Do you in situations like that, is there ever like a right to first refusal or something that, For that seven you're years. offers? Seven. OK, that's what I was wondering, because it, it's got oh man. Yeah, I guess seven years is enough time to be like, all right, somebody else can play with it for a little bit. Um, and, we, and we did pitch them <laughs> over the years. There would be interest from time to time in a reboot or a sequel or a television. We had a great idea for um, for uh, uh, we were we wanted to turn it into a uh, 10 episode arc limited summer series. Yeah. Uh, where uh, in one season we were going to have a do it with two women with a completely different plot. Another which would have been probably the first season where uh, we, because the surgery needed to change a bit, uh, where um, we cross a racial barrier. Oh, I doubt and it. We have, we have a, a black uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who blows this uh, sort of Aryan nation brotherhood uh, cabal apart, leading to a lot, you know, sort of like a Waco kind of, disaster but a few people are surviving including the leader's son who's hell-bent on revenge for his father and then our hero wakes up uh in a some sort of slimy new orleans i think it was motel uh where he um is wearing the face the white face 
of a uh, white nationalist serial killer so, and has to try and get his own life back. Yeah, the, 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 the difference between the first movie and this movie was what Mike just told you was like what happened, but we didn't know in the, the difference is we spent so much time setting up in the first film why they needed to do the surgery. In this, he's just, this guy's just grabbed off the street, wakes up and has a different face on. And, wow. and the whole movie is him trying to figure out why, who did it and why. And he That's discovers crazy. that he's like the serial killer. They basically kidnapped him and stuck a serial killer's face on him and basically yeah. said, go try to survive. And he's also, yeah. does he has to learn all this stuff about this guy's life. Has no idea he's closeted gay. Wasn't he gay? <laughs> Maybe in one version. I don't know. So so this is, this his is boyfriend this. is coming this. on to him. So this is something that you flushed out. But, you know, this is something that was like on paper that you flushed out. Yeah. You know, when we pitched this to Paramount TV. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. That's crazy. That that's that, that's we pitched a few mind. versions. We pitched a few versions. And the ironic thing was like after the movie came out and made a ton of money, we, they said, Hey, could you guys have any ideas for a sequel? All, all the studio did the whole time the movie was being made was complain how much money they were playing Travolta and Gage how they had gotten completely ripped off. And they did. They paid them a shit ton of money. It was worth every dime, but mm -hmm. they they complained about it. And so when, when the movie came out, we had a meeting. And they said, do you have any ideas for a sequel? We said, well, yeah, we do. But, you know, these guys can't swap faces again. I mean, we can't do Travolta right. and Cage. I mean, that would be absurd. Right. And they were like, oh, well, never mind. We're not interested then. We were like, but all you did was complain about how expensive <laughs> they were. You're like, ah, we don't want to do a sequel if it's not Travolta and Cage. And We're now, like, oh. now this new director, writer, they're aren't they trying to get them back? Yeah, I yeah. Saw we don't, we don't know that. the story, but they are. Yes, they're trying to get them back. Maybe just but, for a prologue or teaser. Or sure. Yeah. yeah, like a subplot. <laughs> yeah, my my suspicion, although it's based on absolutely nothing, is my suspicion is they 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 want to use the young kid. At the mm. who comes in, Travolta Caster's son, Adam, yep. of course, would now be grown up. I, my my suspicion is like he's like the lead somehow, and those two guys would be like like they did in Star Wars, you know, like and that, that story like, wrapped up so well in the first film that it would be hard to without stretching too much. Like I like your guys' idea right. of taking the concept instead of the story and using that as a continuation device. Like just that this is this is the thing that connects it to the first one. It's just the concept of what's happening, yeah. the theme, instead of uh, just a, an actual like you know continuation of the first story. Um, Question: Was it a coincidence that Adam wound up with Eve at the end of the movie? <laughs> Yeah, or, why not? You caught us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, the Bible, so that's the greatest story ever written. What you pro guys probably don't know is that there are quite a lot of All About Eve references in the movie. There was a character named Mayor Channing, I think. There, there was quite a lot of, we were, we were, Mike's a big fan of All About Eve and we were. My favorite script. Yeah. And um, he, so we, anyway. So there was a lot of a lot of all of that. that either. Uh, your script uh, earned you a Saturn Award from the Academy of Science and Fiction. It also got Best Movie at the MTV Movie Awards. What kind of effect does that kind of validation have on you as writers when, like? You're after that the the isolation experience. So when you start getting the accolades from the real world, how does how does that affect you? Well, at least we were invited to the Saturn Awards. We weren't <laughs> invited to the MTV Awards. <laughs> That's true. That's crazy. I, we were pretty annoyed about that. <laughs> Everybody's celebrating this great thing we did, but we're not here. Look, oh, wow. I, w I wasn't going to go, but I wanted to be invited. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a particular line or a dialogue or sequence that you mo you're most proud of from this film? Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, for me. It's kind of a very quiet scene, you guys, but um, maybe, well, you've seen the movie recently, I guess, very recently, so it may resonate with you. To me, it's, it's, it's underwritten in the script, but I think Travolta gives, and Joan Allen gives such a bravura moment. It's when um, uh, Travolta is about to go 
out to his office, back up to the FBI office, at, you know, even though he's the bad guy at this point. And mm-hmm. Joan Allen, uh, Eve Archer tells him, you know, I know you don't want to do this, but we have to do it. And and he doesn't know, but he's like agrees. And then they it's the scene where they end up at um, at uh, their son's grave. And it's so emotionally packed because Travolta at first is like, you know, he's going along with the program. But you can really see in his acting in this scene that for possibly the first time in his life, he can feel a victim's pain because there he is holding the the mother of the child he killed, having to comfort her. And there's no way unless you're, you know, 100 percent a monster that that would not mean something to you. And I, I just love that scene, even though it's very quiet. You can kind of see it come out in his character when uh, when he when uh, he's yelling. At, I can't I can't even remember now if it's Nicolas Cage or John Travolta is Caster Troy at this point. But it's it's after that moment where he's like, the kid was an accident. He did say that. And he's saying it almost like he's regretted. Like, that's the equivalent of the most that he can do to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Uh, yeah, That was was very deep. Yeah, that's Nick Cage. In the first couple minutes when he shoots him, and this is the moment when I I first saw this, I thought, oh, shit, this is, like, going to be good, is when Nick pulls the trigger. It's the opening sequence. He pulls the trigger, and the kid gets hit, and then there's a shot back. This is the genius of John Woo. There's a shot back at Nick and Nick looks up over the scope like oh fuck like like mm-hmm. th- even in that one quiet moment th- it, it showed some complexity not the same old bad guy like <laughs> yeah. you know it's like oh fuck like this went really sideways which of course you know he probably happens all the time to him but in, in that moment I thought oh wow this is like the, the ju- you know and very powerful to happen powerful. so early on in the movie to let you know that this is going to be yeah. uh, a more uh, more dimensions than your typical action film. Yeah, and similar to that, there's one other moment similar to that which I I particularly love, which is at the end on the bo- endless boat chase when they're both <laughs> beating the shit out of each other like endlessly, and that was like a quarter of what they shot. But there's this <laughs> moment when the boat is like going to hit the shore, and there's a shot of the two of them turning and looking together at like what's about to happen and the look of like oh fuck like the the opponent is forgotten for one second as they kind of both <laughs> share the dread of what's about to happen and i love i just i love that moment too that's a great metaphor for the world in general it's like hey we're better. all on this big what? ship yeah th- this shit ship that's yeah, going it's down like, this reminds me of peter sellers again being there let's set, the, the, rivalry, set <laughs> the rivalry aside for a moment here there's bigger fish to fry okay all right so last before we move on from face off is there anything else that you think the fans or any one of the film may want to know about face off that they just do not know that you are at a liberty to speak on well interestingly i mean this is not that interesting story i hate to tell you but we were annoyed when the movie was done and it was about to come out that they they studio refused to uh have it like go to you know have like the the press from fangoria and all these science fiction places uh, magazines and stuff because they were terrified of, we didn't realize this, but they were terrified of the science fiction part. And we were like, we would just shook our heads like, well, why did they make this movie? And it's a sci-fi movie. And of course they sold it on John Woo and it's action and all that stuff. But um, I think they made him as kind of, yeah, I think they kind of overthought that a little bit. I think that the movie really would have done well um, among, sci- you know, if they had appealed to science fiction audiences maybe about the ending michael oh well the ending yeah go ahead mike that's a good one well the thing is this um we were going to shoot you know we had written in the script that uh they adopt adam at the end of the movie and we were not allowed to shoot that it was the only scene we we were told you know, basically trickled down from the studio, <laughs> not that far, it went straight to us from the top, saying that uh, American audiences would not accept the uh, uh, the uh, the bad seed joining going into that household after all they'd been through. 
And they, you know, they made a very logical argument for that, but we were still extremely disappointed when that scene was cut uh, and never shot. Well, we were all in Burbank or Glendale uh, in, you know, part of LA for, I think it was the first of two test screens. Yeah, it was the first one. And if the first one, and, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever been a participant in a test screening, but, you know, they show the movie and there's all these uh, 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 flyers, people check off boxes. And then there's a moderator that comes in and asks questions of the audience. Charlie, we're here to judge whatever film we're going to be shown. Thunder Gun 4, Maximum Cool. Well, what we didn't know, but what we were all in some Mexican restaurant at the end, all these uh, you know, hundreds of responses came back. And even though the moderator never asked any question about the end of the movie, and it was favorably, you know, we got good good ratings, not great, but good ratings. At the end, it was apparently like two thirds of the hundreds of people that were in the uh, recruitment audience who didn't know what they were seeing, except they had to be of a certain age. They had all written down, what happened to that kid? <laughs> two thirds of the people took the time to write that that it was not satisfying to them to not know what happened to gina's daughter she died the brother was died. what happened to that boy and so to their credit the head of the studio at the time sherry lansing michael douglas uh steve ruther the producers they turned to us and said you guys were right and then the next day, uh, now you tell the rest of this. Yeah, story. so the next day, my phone, my, my, I hear my the phone rings in my apartment really early. And it's John Wu's assistant saying, John wants, I had given up already. Like, I was like, oh, okay, well, whatever. You know, the I couldn't believe the movie ever even got made. That's not what happened. No, no, I'm going to get there. <laughs> oh, so the phone, so the phone rings and, and uh, uh, Lawrence Walsh, John's assistant says, Oh, could you please fax over? That's how long ago it was. Could you please fax over the original last scene where Adam uh, comes back to the house? So I call Mike and I go, hey, what do you, you know, they want, Lawrence called, they want these pages. What do you think they want this for? Is this like, why do you think they want that? And Mike goes, are you kidding? Oh my God. And he understood right away that they, they were going to shoot it. So the cost of half a million dollars we went back to Pacific Palisades to the location and uh, and shot the original ending. I remember that a little differently, Michael. I, rem I do not remember Lauren, and you may be right, but maybe this is just, you know, it, time is, so much time has passed, but I remember the phone ringing early in the morning, waking me up and it was yeah, John Wu on the line. Oh, okay. And John Wu was saying, you know, that he wanted those pages sent over. He wanted to look look at them, and uh, and I said sure. I called you. You were already awake. Oh, maybe that was it. And you asked me, "Well, what does he want those pages for?" Yeah. And I burst into tears. Yeah, <laughs> right. yep. don't you understand? We got our fucking ending back. Yeah, <laughs> I had no I was clueless. That's exact. That is correct. That is correct. Yes, I remember now. You called oh, very emotional. It was no, there was no intermediary. Yeah, that's hilarious. Well, no, I think what happened was I got a message on my machine early, and oh. then you, and then you, when you called, it was like, yeah, what's that about? You were anyway, but that's true. Yeah, then they reshot that scene. Thank God. At the next test screening, they went. I mean, our numbers. We were told our numbers were higher than Forrest Gump. Wow. It, wow. it was a seismic shift in how the audience walked out of the theater. That's Man. awesome. Man, I, I'm satisfied with it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. I mean, wow, okay. That is something we didn't know about the film. And then there was, an, Michael, didn't we have another thing where one of the pay, setup and payoffs was that uh, uh, Sean Archer and Jamie at the beginning are playing basketball. Yeah, yeah. And he's really bad at it. And he can't sink a shot. Which right. discuss his daughter, and then at the end, Travolta, uh, Sean Archer is is just you know it's in the middle of the night. He can't sleep. He gets up 
and he just starts sinking basket three point shot oh, after three point it. shot. Yeah. And the audience is left to wonder when did he suddenly get this skill or who is that? Because we, yeah, uh, cool. we had, we had had caster doing it earlier as in, I forget where somewhere. Right. Well, that's a testament to a rich story is when you can, when multiple ways to end it all still work so well. Because you just you set up such an effective story with great characters. All right, uh, you got you collaborated uh, with co-writer Claire D. Lim for the family comedy Firehouse Dog, and it was th- this was curious to me because usually, well, I don't know if it's usually I can't speak on that, but you guys are like all over the place as far as genre, and I was wondering if there's like a, a, a conscious difference that you notice to your approach to writing, whether it be, say, like a family comedy versus a horror film. A conscious difference. Well, I, I you know, every script, uh, you, you know, you kind of start with the tonal discussion, I guess, or pretty quickly uh, what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, mm-hmm. In the case of Firehouse Dog, uh, that was sort of a unique a unique undertaking for us um, in that it was an idea that was generated by our friend Claire, who, who we, I went to college with and film school with and known forever. Um, and it was, it, 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 it's kind of, kind of convoluted, but in any case, she pitched that to an executive that Mike and I had worked with before, who we knew, who was looking to do something with us again um, who we had a very good relationship with. And he said, uh, if you can get Mike and Mike to come on as producers, um, you know, we can set this, we, I think we can set this up because it would, it would be cheaper to get us on as producers than as writers, uh, at that point. And so, uh, and we loved the idea and we had never, you know, Mike had written the mask, which is kind of a family film. And he had written Curious mm-hmm. George, I think at that point too. So Mike, my, this was more in Mike's wheelhouse, um, although I, lo- you know, I love the idea of the movie and and um, what we tried to, you know, what we set out to do. So anyway, we had so, kids at that point, so yeah, it was yeah, also yeah. About doing something for that them. makes sense. Yeah, yeah. and so um, that's sort of how it all kind of it kind of came about with sort of alchemy uh, more than more than anything. And we just worked on, you know, we worked with Claire. Uh, on the script and and on her idea that she had cooked up with this guy and and uh you know we as the movie got into production we started taking over more of the writing of it uh having to do with production and the director who mike brought on mike really made the connection with the director and got him on the movie um so yeah so so anyway but um no i think i think uh but there look there were face off inspirations literally in firehouse dog. oh sure yeah i really? mean we were do- the dog is you know a, a replacement for travolta cage and the <laughs> An- angelina jolie and you know other actors that we had written for or worked with and you know he's like a big snob not that they were but <laughs> they weren't actually but we were taking the idea of the iconic hollywood uh a superstar being brought down a several pegs yeah and that Mm -hmm. was the genesis of the movie i mean you know this is a dog that is a massive box office rintintin kind of superstar uh uh you know who's done uh, even had a a hit on broadway in the canine mutiny (laughs) and terrier at twenty thousand feet and all these other films (laughs) he's been in uh jurassic bark Starring Gina Gershon in the poster, um, yes. and he'd done all these films with and, the same and, technologies. And then his toupee flies off once he gets. He's doing some sort of aerial stunt, and uh, everyone thinks he's dead, and he has to learn, you know, how to be a, a real hero. Wow. That when I'm when I'm writing something, it seems like it it becomes kind of like all encompassing, like it 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 kind of pollutes my thoughts, whatever the content matter is. So like I've, I've done suspense, I've done horror and, and you could definitely feel yourself kind of every once in a while, you kind of have to go for a walk or, or just go out in, in the real world and remind yourself that, that the world you're creating isn't, isn't everything right now. But Um, go out with a notepad. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But with a family film, it seems like, it, like, did you feel that, uh, like a difference in the energy as far as, um, the effect that it had on, on you as a writer putting it together in compared to something like face off or the horror horror, the well, early horror always, films you worked on. Always fun working with Michael. And we just really had a good time, you know, sort of stretching the boundaries of what we, we had been known for at the time. And it was still a high action adventure movie in many respects. I mean, yes, it, you've got Josh Hutcherson and Bruce Greenwood and, uh, uh, and, you know, four Irish terriers playing the one uh, hero dog. But but it was still there's, you know, there's there's arsons and there's a killer and and um, uh, and, you know, of course, there's a fair amount of comedy in it because it's it's a, a family film. But uh, but yeah, I mean, the, and, and basically there's the, the structure structuring a film, whether it's a comedy or a horror film or an action film, it's it, the process is pretty similar yeah. for yeah, us. I want to ask you this, because you said Mike, and uh, when you guys worked together, as, as you guys called it Mike and Mike, what I want to ask you guys was this, and, uh, and either one of you can take this. The last time you worked together, according to IMDb, tells us it was 2010 on the Cartoon Network series Unnatural History. Now, we did see and read a mention um, about a project in possible development, if you can speak to it, called Prophets of the Ghost Aunts. Is that true? And what factors dictate how and when you guys work together? Look, Prophets of the Ghost Ants, if you have if you like uh dystopian fantasy novels, the trilogy that Clark Carlton, who by the way, we also went to film school with, uh, did the the uh novelization of Face Off and is a marvelous writer. Uh we love those books and we're still hoping to get it made someday. But uh, but that has not happened so far. Right now, we are working together. Actually, when when I created Unnatural History, which was, I think, the first live action show for Cartoon Network, um, I brought Michael in because I don't like to do anything without him. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so he came on as a, a writer producer on the show. And we wrote a few episodes together and we wrote some separately. Uh, of course, I, I you know, I wrote the pilot, but um but uh, now uh, the the uh, the wheel has turned completely because Michael's attached to. Uh, can we even talk about it? Yeah, Mike? yeah, sure. So Michael yeah. Michael has co-created um, a, uh, a adaptation of Everett Hartso's uh, 90, 1990s um, uh, fantasy uh, comic book series Razor, uh, and uh, that is gearing up for a September production in Europe. And Michael's awesome. brought me on it. Thank God. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Thank God. Listen, why can't you be that type of friend to me? When are you going to bring me on? I'm going to switch this off. So the, answer, so the answer is pretty simple. You guys have, have tried working with other people. You prefer, you, you in, at least enjoy working with each other. So it's just a matter of just when opportunity presents itself, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah if, the, if it's a, yes, certainly. Uh, 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 yes. I, I've, I've always felt uh, a lot more confident with what I was doing, knowing that Mike was there keep, keeping me from outsmarting myself uh, too often. Um, and working on his show, Unnatural History, that was a bit of an adjustment, I must say, because, you know, Mike and I had been partners up to that time, but now I was going to be his employee. And uh, that gave me, I was like, uh oh, now what's going to happen? And uh, it turned out to just be the best gig I ever had. Um, I loved the show. And Mike, while Mike was getting all these terrible phone calls about budget and things like that from the studio, I was just in the writer's room doing what I, what I loved the most, which is dealing with the scripts, dealing with the writers, breaking the stories, doing all that stuff. I didn't have to deal with any of the real headaches. Um, that, that yeah, he wouldn't even go up to Toronto. Where we were shooting, yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway, but uh, that's very, 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 no, I, I should have. I really should have. I, I definitely let 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 down the team on that. But um, by the way, but, um, the the prop of Sputnik One is in my extra room. Do you want it back? How did you get it? Oh yeah, Gave that's right. For the that's 10th right. Anniversary. Special. Yes, I will take it back. Sure. Yeah. He doesn't want it. We have all these little props on our desk. We'll put it here for the show for everybody. Oh to see well, this one's big. This one. This. It's a real Sputnik size Sputnik. Oh yeah, no, 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 no
Yeah, we already barely have enough room to get around in here. <laughs> let, let me ask you guys this, and, and, and both of you can speak to this, and I want you to speak from the heart because, again, we ask this question, and sometimes it could, most people, they'll answer it, and sometimes we can tell what's a little cliche, and sometimes but we can feel it from their heart. So let me ask you this. If you guys had to both give advice, give advice to aspiring writers, what would your advice be? That 16-year-old kid in high school right now with that med notebook or that composition notebook, I mean, what would you tell them? I would tell them... I'm going to only speak to uh, movie or TV writing, but yeah. my one piece of advice would be that um, once they start, they need to uh, let it overwhelm them. What they need to do is start writing. Once you start writing, you can't stop. I'm not saying you have to work 12 hours a day. Even if you only have a half an hour, you need to keep it on your mind mm -hmm. all the time. So if you're at school and you have a you know part time or full time job or you're you know a young parent or whatever, you what you have to do is make sure that you don't let it get away from you. So to say, oh, you know what? I'm busy today. I'm going to start on it tomorrow. The problem is if you let it go for one day, that turns into two, that turns into a week, a week, that turns into a month, and then it's gone. And that yeah. that and that's not writing. Even if you can just grab um, five minutes to look over what you'd written the day before and then push it forward a little bit, that means it's still present. So. So uh, that's one thing. The second piece of advice I'd give, which is just about writer's block. Um, writer's block often happens when you get past the point where you know what you're doing <laughs> and either you're afraid to write something uh, that you're not sure of or that feels wrong or whatever. Here's what I always do. And it's it, to me, it's been really helpful. I announce out loud generally to myself I'm going to write the shittiest scene ever written <laughs> right now. I'm going to write the most expository on the nose piece of nonsense. And once I do that, I've exercised the demons of having to be great on a first draft, which you rarely are, unless you're like Charlie Kaufman or someone. And so I write the most on the nose scene I can do, can write. And then at some point, it starts to flow again. You can go back and rewrite that crap. And then you just, actually, that's two bits of advice. The third piece of advice, final piece of advice, before I hand it over to someone who's better at this than I am, which is Michael Cleary, is that don't give up when you're on a roll and it's now three in the morning or whenever, whatever your process is. And you're writing, writing, writing. And then it's like, oh, oh, great. I got through this whole sequence. Now I can crash. Don't do that. Start to write the next scene mm -hmm. that you know, and then let it go. Because then when you come back to the next day, you know where to start. Because yeah. if you, if you, shut yourself off when you get to the end of a, of a sequence and you're satisfied with it, it's harder to start the next day. Always leave something dangling so you can pick it up where you know, and then you can keep going past that. All right, I'll shut up now. That, that, that's amazing. That, that was awesome advice. Thank you very much for sharing that. And it's so true, that especially that last thing you said, because there's something that makes returning to the desk so much easier when you already have the foundation to just kind of play on and rather than yeah that that's and, and stepping away from something and and letting yourself forget about it i've done that once or twice it doesn't feel good you beat yourself up about it internally and then eventually you're like i'm just gonna stop beating myself up about it and it doesn't get done and it's a very and it's the hardest part about writing is starting to write but once you sit down it's so true you are it's you're in it that's, that's awesome. Right. Michael, uh, yet again, he set you up for failure. That's hard to follow, but go well, ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I won't even attempt to, to master uh, uh, match that. Um, you know, the, the, probably the biggest lesson, uh, there's a few, few if you don't mind, I'll, a few lessons. One is 
your biggest obstacles to success, I don't want to sound like Tony Robbins, but your big will be yourself. And, and unfortunately, for whatever reason in our culture, or what it, maybe it's just humanity, people who are writers are very, very hard on themselves first. They are harder on themselves and think things of themselves that they would never say to another person. I think in a million years, uh, they will say to themselves, and that's crippling and paralyzing. And so, I, you know, that's a great, that's a very important lesson to learn is to feel entitled to this undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we all grew up reading great literature. And then when we sit down and write two sentences and it's, you know, we compare our first two sentences to, you know. Uh, uh, my name is Ishmael. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. My, you know, and you go, oh my God, I'm a failure. Well, no, you're just looking at it backwards. Um, yeah. So, so getting support, starting support begins with yourself, but then support begins with others as well. And I think longevity in this art and craft and business uh, really depends on the support of others, the understanding of others um, around you. They don't have to necessarily help, know how to help you block out your story, but they have to understand when you're trying to accomplish something, when you're trying to work. I mean, the old, the old, uh, you know, the old sort of saw is, you know, the writer, the, the, the wife or the husband, of the writer is in the room staring at the computer and the other spouse comes in and starts talking to them and says, you know, when the writer says, I'm working, they say, well, you're not typing anything. You know, right. it, it's like learning to understand if you guys want to, you know, see that in action, go see the phantom thread, Paul Thomas Anderson's ode to being interrupted by mm -hmm. someone who's not creative, which is what that whole movie, and he, and he has the great line. Yes, you will leave, but the interruption will remain. Um, so <laughs> That's so awesome. learning how this stuff works um, is how it works. It's not doing anything wrong. It's just that is the process. And so learning to feel entitled to the messiness of it and owning the messiness of it is a really important step in any mm -hmm. artist's development. And the quicker you get to that, the, 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 the more, ha the happier you will be trying to create. Um, and that, and that takes support around you, but beginning with your, with your own self. And I will recommend one book called uh, the war of art by a fellow named Stephen Pressfield. And if you haven't read this book, it's fan freaking fantastic. Pressfield's a novelist and he wrote screenplays and whatnot. He's a very successful writer, a wonderful writer. But he wrote a great book. He's written a few of them now called The War of Art. And it's it's a just like just nuts and bolts, no airy fairy process, left brain, right brain. It's just all about, as he puts it, overcoming resistance. Mm -hmm. The resistance to you doing what you say you want to do. Um, and it's fantastic. It just cuts through a ton of bullshit. And it's a wonderful, easy read. And it's very inspiring. Um, because he talks about this process and how he gets himself to his desk every day, uh, and 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 is productive, and that's it's what it's all about. Art. You say it's, it's called, called the War, War of Art. War of Art by Stephen okay. Pressfield. Amazing. That is great advice, and that that again, that's true too. Because my my wife is uh, she. She, Angela, I didn't tell him to say this, Angela, if you're watching. She is a very tall, uh, she, she, she's, she's a chatterbox. Like she wakes up like a machine gun ready to go. And I'm the exact opposite. I'm usually in my head. I'm, I'm think, and, and neither of us are wrong. Neither of us are right. But the, but what makes it work is the fact that she, um, she recognizes when I'm internalizing and, and respect, respects that like uh, she almost like protects that quiet time for me and it is so instrumental in having that ability to be in your thoughts like and, and also, also to not and to be in your thoughts in that quiet without having to feel guilty about the fact that you're in in your thoughts and in that in that quiet space you just got somebody divorced there's somebody gonna watch this episode <laughs> sit next to their spouse and be like you know you never supported me oh okay. good <laughs> good then <laughs> let me do them a favor Go find somebody that wants to talk and you go find somebody that wants to be quiet. Hey, right. um, in your opinion, and uh, Mike, I think you answered this with uh, all about Eve, but feel free if it's a different answer. But what is your favorite, and this is both of you, what's your favorite film from a writer's perspective? Or for, like as far as the script goes? Yeah, all about Eve for sure. It's just brilliant. There's not a flabby line, nothing wasted in that. 
and um, and then uh, I don't know, probably Preston Sturgis is uh, the Lady Eve. I was just gonna pretty say much that. anything that he he's done. Uh, I'm only I guess I'm only talking about old movies, but um, Casablanca is flawless. Um, just looking at you, kid. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, those are good. Amazing. And David, what'd you say your was a Requiem for a Dream? Wasn't that right? Uh, no, right. writing? Are you talking yeah, about writing? Why? No, I'm talking about him. I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> I love the animated, I put you on the spot. Uh, animated Spider-Man movie. Um, yes. 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 It's, it's a, a Spider-Verse. Spider-Man, 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 Spider-Man into the Miles Morales. Yes. One of the great, one of the greatest movies ever made. Forget that it's animated. Right. Wow. <laughs> Blew me away. Brilliant. Listen, if you can make a spider pig work, that's hell. That's hella writing right there. Spider pig worked, okay? Yeah. And Nick that's, Cage is in that, right? As a voice, yes. As a, isn't he uh, noir is all... Spider Man? He, he doesn't do comic book Marvel-y stuff so well. You come to me for that, but yes, he is. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, I just had to let him know. It's not uh, your well, thing. No, I appreciate it. Dude, that. you need to rewatch uh, uh, Infinity Wars and Endgame. They're great. Rewatch. I gotta watch them. <laughs> I can't. It is an. It's an undertaking. You're embarrassing me in front of them right now. You know I've seen these movies forty seven thousand no, times. I've, You're I've seen like I've seen Doctor Strange. I've seen the Sam Raimi Spider Man's. I appreciate. I don't. I don't hate on Marvel films. There's just so it, it's, Easy, it's so much Easy. to catch up on at this point. It's just like if I started well, now. Doctor I, Strange is is superb. Superb, superb, and, and I'm yeah, and I'm so was Wanda. I don't know if you guys watched Wanda Vision on Disney Plus. I loved it. Paul loved Bateman it. Lo- loved it. Great writing. Yes, they can come on anytime. <laughs> they can come on anytime. <laughs> um, um, Michael, did you have a? Uh... Oh, um, well, uh, um, the Lady Eve. I, I, I definitely um, second that emotion. It's, it's like, yeah, I agree. Casablanca's flawless. Lonely uh, heart. What's that? What was the other one? Lonely Hearts. Lonely Hearts. Oh, I didn't, you know, yeah, I'm in there I a little bit. Th- thanks for that. thanks for the plug. Appreciate it. Um, Die Hard is a great script. Um, just again, a brilliant, brilliant screenplay, brilliantly constructed screenplay. Um, oh, The Third Man, great, mm. fantastic script, fantastic film. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of flawless. Also, oh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. How could I fail to mention that? <laughs> yeah, Raiders. That's where um, we all started. Just, yeah. They got the first right. Godfather. Well, both Godfather, first two Godfather movies. Are, I mean, not, I, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to say anything too, uh, cut, you know, kind of groundbreaking here in terms of, of all these great scripts. Um, there certainly are okay. a bunch. That's for Blood sure. Right, really quick. Now you, uh, I, I know, um, Michael, you're, you're, you're actually both you guys talking about the, uh, the adaptation or, or the, uh, I think the adaptation of Razors and Mike, I saw you, you recently worked on the TV series Salvation. Um, Michael, you were the showrunner on the series Professionals. Is there, uh, and feel free to talk about those projects. Um, we're at the plug portion of the interview now. If there's anything that you guys have coming out or anything you want to let the audience know about, um, please do let us know. Well, Mike, you want to talk about Razor or you want to close on that? Um, well, well, uh, professionals was a show I made with the same producer that's working on razor with, with now with Mike and I might be, um, Jeff most who produced the original crow and the specialist nice. and a ton of other stuff The Irene, uh, Sendler movie that, um, which was a great film. Um, anyway, uh, so, but we made, he and I were, Mike was not involved in this, but we made, we shot a show called professionals in South Africa with Tom Welling and Brenda, Brendan Frazier. Um, which we sold to the CW. It is set up at the CW. There's no air date yet. Um, and that, unfortunately, that kind of got, got screwed up in COVID. Um, we, we just finished shooting when COVID hit. and It dragged it all out. and mm-hmm. It made it a lot difficult to complete. But, you know, we're looking forward to it when it turns up on CW. Um, and then Razor. Yeah, Razor is supposed to go into production in September. You know, they're trying to get the all the pieces kind of together at the same time uh looking but good. it's looking very good yeah jeff is a jeff jeff most is a machine and um he he said if he says it's going to happen i believe <clears throat> after professionals uh which <clears throat> is the first independently produced tv series of all you know of all time he put the financing together for that you know he said yeah. it was going to happen and it did so i always believe him now 
Um, I feel like Brendan Fraser needs a comeback too. I'd be really awesome if that comes out. Oh, he's, he yeah. does. Yeah. He, he, he has a little bit of a comeback. He's definitely in some stuff. He's going to be in the new Scorsese movie, uh, the Western. Um, he's mm-hmm. on Doom Patrol, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's, I, 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 I can't, I wish I could take credit for, for it all, but he's really wonderful and professionals. He plays a billionaire, like a tech billionaire who is just this wonder, you know, he's Brendan Fraser basically, but as a tech billionaire, he's just the most lovable kind of guy and brilliant and, and all these things. And he's quite totally out of his fish out of water kind of story, but he is, he's very good in it. So yeah, I, we, everyone wants to see more of Brendan Fraser. Of course, That's I awesome. I still watch the mummy any chance I get. Uh, yeah, 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 and bedazzled. That's a oh, guilty yeah, pleasure for me. Well, I mean, I, 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 I can place like fifteen different characters in one movie. Okay, guys, it's bittersweet, but we've come to the end of the interview. But we do two pre-recorded. Oh, wait, no, no, no. We got, we got what, 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 what Mike's got coming out. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mike. I'm sorry. Oh my goodness, Mike. Yes. Uh, what do you have coming out that you can speak on? I apologize. No, you're, you're working on uh, Razor with uh, with Michael. Yeah, working right? on Razor with Michael. You know, I think you mentioned I, I worked on for two seasons on the cbs summer series salvation which is the uh serious version of don't look up and uh nice. um and then i before that um i was um a writer consulting producer on season two of the halle berry series extant which I'm is a, a sci-fi series and boy i have to tell you she's got to be one of the nicest people i've ever met i mean okay. lit- actually of all the s- of all the actors of that level that I've met, she is without question the favorite. Just such a decent, big hearted, funny, witty uh, person who when, you know, when you're with her takes, it's not all about her, does not take up any more air in the room than anyone else. Anyway, that was a great experience. And so, you know, like Michael and the, and, professionals uh the thing he was just talking about and razor that we've been talking about so i've also sort of and you know unnatural history a while ago i'm totally bitten by the tv bug now uh it's awesome i love watching so many of these shows now um like the great or uh or the expanse which is phenomenal season six just wrapped um Mm -hmm. and so you know speaking of all these uh, sci-fi fantasy things uh, uh, so naturally I'm writing, uh, a, a spec, uh, TV pilot right now, uh, set, it's a, a legal, legal crimity set in New York in the late 19th century. <laughs> nice. Intriguing. And it's a true story. It's a true story. Yeah. Of which I'll that. say no more. Yeah. <laughs> So, do you, do, uh, sorry, this has come to my mind. Going back to your advice that you have for writers, and you're talking about, you know, you're 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 working on a show. You just finished one. You're writing another idea. Do you write every day? Oh yeah, yeah. Michael has That's to. A, yeah, <laughs> because his duties on Razor are much more expansive than mine. But yeah, I'm I'm writing every day. I I really want to get this uh, this pilot finished before uh, this gentleman here uh in the black shirt uh you, be, you better finish it tonight because uh, it tells me <laughs> that uh i have to suddenly move to athens greece where it looks yeah. like those are going to be shot oh well I think it sounds like you might owe him one though because he didn't go show to up to the show did, yeah he didn't well, go to toronto yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's true. Yeah. Uh, he was like why did you bring that's, that up he's it, cursing it's all about that uh <laughs> Well, uh, guys, again, so I want to say this is it literally is bittersweet to me because, again, I didn't know I'm happy. I really, really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation talking film. You guys are film buffs. You even and you're writers. But at the same time, again, you're still lovers of film. And that's why we want to have you guys on. And I promise you guys, this is the last question. Do you have any parting words for the audience? We would like both of you to take at least 60 seconds each and give the audience parting words. It can be about whatever life politics what does not matter just some parting words and, and you could take as many seconds as you want to it doesn't like have to be a seconds. minimum you said at least well, no, that was 60 a, seconds well, they like might want to gotta... speak they <laughs> might want to speak go ahead i'm sort of talked <laughs> <laughs> oh okay see there we, we did our job in we did well, this is this has been great so this is a fantastic really fantastic and um Thank you so much for having us on yeah we we uh, don't often get a chance to talk about uh uh, face off or our careers or just movies in general. And you guys asked a lot of great questions. 
questions we hadn't been asked before. So that was that was yeah. special, really nice. Oh, I also oh, love Speed you. Racer. Oh yeah, Look Speed Racer. Oh. The Wachowski uh, Speed Racer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> so yeah, underrated. Exactly. The the most underrated Wachowski film. I have color. to I have to make them mad before we go. Did either one of you see the film Pixels? Pixels. No. Oh What's no, up? I haven't. Good. Damn Keep it. it that way. Keep it that way. You're, that's... All right. It was a conversation for another. Uh, day. Why you are you in it? Much for, oh, no, no, I'm not in it, but he never wants to see it, but I love it. And so we, we're trying to break the tie here. We need one of our guests to actually see the film. So we got to, mm -hmm. Adam Sandler pixels, Kevin James. Oh, yeah. I know. Yeah. I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> he's in your camp. I can tell you right now. He's in your camp. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time out. If you ever need anything from us, please know that we will be here to return the favor. If you got something coming out, you want to do a promo on it, oh, we'll, we'll do a breakdown of it for you guys. We wish you nothing but success. And, and best, uh, best, best of luck with the uh, Razor production. Correct. And, uh, oh, oh, thank you. And, yeah. and Back with, at you uh, guys. Best of luck. There. And by the way, if you guys ever want to just get on and talk about movies or do. Yes. You know, yeah. I yes. Mean, that's always a fun topic. And happy to, I mean, schedule permitting i'm sure yeah let's let's do that awesome uh, yeah. yeah thanks for getting back to me michael and thanks for coordinating this with, with mike getting this you sure. know helping get this set up really appreciate your guys time thank you so yeah. much yeah. seriously thank you so much keep right keep writing and we'll keep watching okay that sounds good <laughs> all right thanks we'll try to do the same all right thank you bye, bye. bye.